Hi, I'm Femi OK and you're in the stream. Today, fulfilling a child's right to learn, we discuss global education with former Australian Prime Minister Julia Gillard. So Julia Gillard is standing by waiting for your questions. Now she's been a trailblazer in many ways throughout her political career. As Australia's former Prime Minister, she was the very first woman to serve in that role and as Deputy Prime Minister before that. So we're about to dive into a topic that's long been a personal cause for her and that's education development. So Julia, it is great to have you here in the stream. Thank you very much. So this current job, this role that you have right now, Global Partnership for Education Chair, I did not see that advertised anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> How did you get it? Uh, were you going to apply? <laughs> I, I might have done. You know, after I've led a country, perhaps then I might be ready to do that job. Uh, I was uh, reached out to by the Global Partnership Hoshy for Education. Your head which, was hunted. Uh, yes, it's, it's still there on my shoulders, <laughs> but it's a tremendous opportunity for right. me. What took me into politics was a focus on education and sure. making sure every child in my own country got a great quality education. And we had work to do, and still work to do, because mm. there are big disparities between richer and poorer communities and particularly for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders right. Australians but now I've got the uh, okay. opportunity to make a difference around the world for children's education uh, and one of the things I've been really focused on as chair of the Global Partnership for Education is the subject of money right. because we've got our replenishment round in Brussels this time next week where we're trying to get donor governments to pledge money and developing countries to say yes we'll spend more on education. Julia, fantastic. Take a pause for a moment because we're going to make you do a lot of work. Okay. <laughs> but Malika Blau is our digital producer for mm -hmm. the stream. So we've got our online community. What are they saying? What do they want to say to, to Julia? Well, lots of people already have questions. They're lining Good. up and I am lining those questions up. Uh, but one of the things we're following is the conversation online around a hashtag that Julia is promoting and that is because of school. You'll see here it's showing up all over the world. So this is a tweet from South Africa. Because of school, I'm an open-minded young woman determined to make a difference in the lives of others. One more from Oslo, Norway. I became unable to follow the herd or accept anything without question because of school. So you too at home can join this conversation with your questions and comments. Use hashtag AJStream. And also standing by with their questions and their comments, we have an international panel of education advocates and they're with us via Skype on Google+. So Asma Miguel is a student in Afghanistan. Nikhil Goyal is an education activist in New York. Hannah Godefa is a UNICEF Ethiopia ambassador in Canada. And Franklin Moreri is a university student in Kenya. So welcome everybody. It's great to have you in the stream. And if any Anybody Thank else? You. Yeah, you're very welcome. Can't wait to hear from you. But anybody else, if you're watching right now and you're thinking, I want to be where Franklin's sitting right now, or how did Hannah get on TV? Well, it's very easy to do it. Go to Google+, go to the stream, join us in the circles, and one day you too could be in the stream. My name is Jasmine Garz. I am a reporter out of Mexico City, and I am in the stream. It's hard to imagine not being able to read or write, but that's the reality for the 57 million children around the world who don't go to school. Half of them are girls, and many live in countries where conflict, instability, poor funding prevents young people from getting an education. Even for kids who do have the opportunity to go to school, about 250 million are not learning basic skills like reading and writing and maths. That's according to a report commissioned by the United Nations. So these are some of the very critical education issues that Julia Gillard will be grappling with as chair of the Global Partnership for Education. Julia, before we kind of get into the meat of that, I'm going to show you something on my laptop. Sure. So you'll see it back here, and I'm going to show everybody back here. Um, <laughs> oh my goodness, so adorable and cute and smart and curious. This is what I'm getting from this picture. Do you remember this picture? Uh, I do remember that picture. I'm a fair bit younger there. <laughs> I'm sure you can see that. Really. Yes. Uh, that's a picture we had taken when we got to Australia. Australia. My family migrated from Wales, from the United Kingdom to Australia, so right. there was me and my sister who was three years older, yeah. and we got to Australia, settled in, and we yeah. got uh, pictures taken to show we were oh, there, and that's one of them. Wow. Okay, so as a school kid, so I've got you here as, uh, as a teen here, so you're sort of about 17 here. Okay. All right, so 
What were you like? What was your temperament like? Uh, this is truly getting scary. I hope this is the <laughs> it's end. It's going to stop here. Yeah, the <laughs> end of on. the family <laughs> photos. Uh, I was a pretty studious child, a pretty right. quiet child, actually right. fairly shy, which mm. is a bit odd when you end up in politics and yelling in question time and all the other things I've yeah. done during my life. Yeah. Uh, look, don't I look studious there? Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, uh, but I was always focused on education, you know, as a high school pre Effect, I'd go down and help the kids in the junior school yeah. to do their school work better and to make sure they so felt at home at school. So were you good at two-shoes? You were never bad and the teacher was like, Julia's my favourite student. Oh, I think I was a little bit of a goody two-shoes, okay. yes. I got a bit more rat bag at university, but right. I think I was a bit of a goody two-shoes in high school. All right. Malika? Well, of course, it's that goody two-shoes uh, uh, perspective that led you here. And so we have a few of those same type of people in our hangout. So Asma uh, is sitting in Afghanistan. Now, Asma, someone tweeted this to us not too long ago. We asked, why are so many people around the world not receiving quality education? And Samandar writes back, how many countries are at war or in some kind of armed conflict? Don't look further. Your answer lies there. Now, Asma, you're speaking to us from Kabul and you're quite accomplished. Uh, speak to us. Yeah, so what I think about um, education, it's... Uh, light <laughs> that brings you from darkness to lightness that's what i think of um, education and nobody has the right to take this um, right from you that's what i think and um, challenges the challenges we face in afghanistan we know that afghanistan is a country where we experience three decades of war and so here in afghanistan what are the common problems we have is first safety nobody nobody likes to take <coughs> a risk to go out of their house for getting an education and not knowing whether they're gonna come back live or get back to their home so as a problem asma what is mm -hmm. it when you've got somebody like julia who's kind of spent a big chunk of her career focusing on education and now she's got a new life and role as an education advocate, what is it that you think that she might be able to help you with and your fellow students in Afghanistan? Ask her. Yeah, so I just wanted to um, ask you what can be the um, step we can take, the smallest action we can do to help human getting an education. Asma, you summarised it beautifully, saying education is a step from the darkness into the light and just transforms lives. I've had the opportunity to actually travel in Afghanistan. I was there a few times as Australian Prime Minister, so I've been to Kabul and uh, seen some of the sites in the city. Uh, the Global Partnership for Education is involved in Afghanistan. Uh, we're involved in supporting, uh, spreading school, getting girls into school and lifting the quality of the education and we've enjoyed some success I mean 42 percent of the students enrolled in Afghanistan now in school are girls so that's a big step up from what it used to be but we're really conscious that there is so much more to do in Afghanistan so we're going to stay working there with the Minister for Education Minister Wardak uh, and with civil society and education groups and listening to students who know more about it than anybody else about what needs to be done to uh, you know get the education system up to where you would like it to be and I would love it to be. Julia mm -hmm. I, I have to admit that I was a little bit cynical when I saw what new job you were going to have and I was thinking oh, these former politicians they also need a high profile role because otherwise they get they, they get bored and they don't have anything to do and they don't have anyone to boss around until I look back four years and I found this comment have a look on my laptop so this is back in 2010 it, and Julia says if I had a choice I'd probably be in a school watching kids learn to read in Australia than here in Brussels at international meetings and that was when you were Prime Minister of Australia so it really does show that there's it's a passion for you but why <laughs> where, where, where does that go back 
to. Uh, that actually caused a media storm in Australia because yeah. everybody said, oh, she's not interested in foreign policy and she's yeah. Prime Minister. And what I did after that was when I travelled internationally, I would do all of the foreign policy work and the big meetings, but I'd always make sure I went to a school in whatever country I visited. Right. And I used to say to our travelling journalists, if you want to see the future of any country around mm -hmm. the world, don't go to the big meeting hall, go to a school because that's where the future's being made. And that passion really comes from my family background. Sure. My father in particular didn't get the opportunity to mm. finish school. Uh, he grew up in South Wales in a coal mining village, pretty poor background, had to leave school at 14, mm. always regretted it. Uh, got to live a long, healthy and happy life, but I've always thought what different life could my dad have had if he'd got the access to education that he wanted as a young man? Sure. And why should anyone around the world, girl or boy, be denied that power, that access, that ability to write their own story with right. many choices in front of them instead of limited choices because they didn't get to finish school? Well, Julie, I'm glad that you said that girl or boy because we just got this tweet a couple minutes ago from someone who says it's boys failing at schools now and in the past girls needed the boost and encouragement and now boys do worse and they need help. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, look, there's a, a mix here. I mean, tremendous progress has been made in girls' education. If you go back to 1990, around 50% of girls were in school. Now we're up at 80%, so that's good change. But there are still the missing millions, girls and boys, 57 million of them. And then there's quality issues for both girls and boys. So we can't forget, you know, the, the real problems for girls' education. Look at Nigeria, the security issues, spreading access from primary school to secondary school we get less girls making that transition because of things like forced marriage child marriage the world's got a front up to those questions some of them quite hard but when boys are saying look we're not happy with the quality of our education either we're not achieving as we'd like to at school then that's a real issue and it's not either or for me it's both girls and boys every one of them getting a great quality education so you mentioned quality Julia, yeah go ahead frank yes i have a follow-up to that question Sure. The, the issue of uh, girls uh, in science education, because we feel, especially in Africa uh, and Kenya, there seems to be a shortage of girls venturing into typically male-dominated fields like engineering or biology. And so is there uh, a way or a policy that the global platform for education, the global partnership for education, does it have a stimulus for that to encourage girls to venture into that area? Our prime mission is to achieve the Millennium Development Goal of universal access to primary school education for every child. And the kids who are missing out now in fragile and conflict affected countries, very poor kids, often in rural settings outside big cities, you know, marginalised, persecuted ethnic minorities, children with disabilities, uh, disproportionately girls. So that's our core mission. Uh, but because I'm so interested in education, you're absolutely right. By the time you get to secondary school and beyond, so many jobs require you to have science and maths and a really good grounding in those subjects and so many girls shy away from those subjects. Uh, you know, even when I was in school many, many years ago, I studied physics and I was the only girl in the class. So this has been a really persistent problem. I think it's about uh, creating role models of women in science to inspire girls or women in engineering, women in maths, that this isn't somehow boys' stuff, this is everybody's stuff and they can get really good at it too. Well, this isn't just boy stuff, and I, I love that segue to Hannah, because Hannah, you're a UNICEF ambassador. You're, you're really out there. You're doing this. This is your stuff. So what mm -hmm. uh, question do you have for Julia that could help inform the work that you're doing? Well, I'm actually very thankful that uh, Julia highlighted a lot of uh, key groups in the core mission of uh, GPE and the work that they're doing around the world. And what I would like to know is uh, what can we do right now to ensure that what the groups that you were mentioning, the most marginalized, the most out of reach uh, children that no one can get in touch with, can have access to education for a more successful future in the post-2015 agenda? 
Uh, thanks, Hannah. One thing that people can do right now is because we're in the run up to our replenishment conference, one week to go, so that's, you know, ticking clock, not many days, and we need uh, donor governments around the world to come to that conference and to pledge money for change, and we need developing countries to come and say, we're going to spend more on education. So, Julia, so what is your pitch for that? Because right now, people and many countries are their resources are not being focused on education, otherwise GPE would have no job to do. So how do you pitch to them? How do you convince them that it's worth their while handing over millions and millions to help with education? Uh, well, we're looking for money in the billions. I know, I, I was being conservative here. Yeah, okay, so it's gotta be a really great pitch. It's what is that um, billion dollar pitch? Then? The, the uh, billion dollar pitch, uh, if we are truly gonna change lives, yeah. nations, our world, then it starts with education. Yeah. And it is impossible for us to imagine a world in the future that is peaceful and prosperous if today's children don't get an education. It's just impossible. Yeah. So that's the pitch in summary. Yeah. And then we say, uh, aid dollars, you know, yes, they're hard to come by, but actually education aid has gone down by 10% in yeah. the last few years. Uh, Australia has cut its aid budget too, right? Uh, yeah, uh, look, I, I, uh, <laughs> I understand that and uh, you know the new government's made some decisions mm. about aid and you know when I was in government it was uh, it's tough it's yeah. tough for domestic governments to make decisions about aid but when we do we've got to make sure that those dollars go where they're going to do the most good and education is going to do the most long-term good sure. and that they're spent through an effective body like the Global Partnership for Education which can show such a good track record right. of making change. Just a quick thing I want to throw out to Hannah because Hannah uh, works with UNICEF so she said post 2015 agenda and Julia because she works in education she knows exactly what the post 2015 yes. agenda is. Hannah in a nutshell for lay people who've never been to the UN what does that mean? Mm -hmm. Well, the post-2015 uh, 2015 agenda are basically summarizing how far we've come in the Millennium Development Goals and what can every country do to ensure that the new uh, Millennium Development Goals target uh, every key group uh, in their country, in their nation, and really help uh, support growth. Yes, she's, she's getting into like U UN jargon there. I just wanted to open it up for everybody else. Uh, Malika. Well, I'd like to open this up to Nikhil in our Hangout. Nikhil, go ahead. Yeah, no, thank you for having me. But I, I, I want to kind of push back a little bit because um, based on my research and reporting, I've noticed that when oftentimes when you introduce schooling and oftentimes when you force it into a community, uh, there can be devastating effects. Um, and I'm sure you know about what happened with Aboriginal people in Australia, Native Americans in the United States, and Indigenous people in Canada. They were forced into residential boarding schools, stripped of their culture, traditions, and and language um, and forced to be assimilated into this Western culture. Um, so I'm wondering how you can, how can we assure that those effect, those, those results don't happen when we bring in schooling into these communities? Yeah, that is a great question and I can absolutely assure you that the way GPE works, the whole emphasis is on that word partnership in the middle of the name. It's a partnership at the board level donors, developing country partners, civil society, private sector, private philanthropy, and then within countries, we don't roll in and say, hi, I'm from Australia and I've got all the answers. We don't do that. We work with the developing country government, with education, society, civil society, experts within that country. Uh, they're in the lead, generating a whole education sector plan that works for their nation. And that plan will be different in Yemen to what is gonna work in Vietnam, to what is gonna work in Afghanistan. Uh, they're gonna be different things, but they're all gonna be you know, with one goal, and that goal has to be that young people emerge from schooling with the skills that they're going to need for their life and work and the ability to make choices in the future. So, you know, it's no, it, whatever language it is, you need to end up literate, people need to end up numerate. These are core skills to give people life chances. But there's not, none of that old fashioned, and I know exactly what you mean in my country, there's none of that old fashioned approach of saying, uh, you've got to forget who you are or your culture or your ways and just do what we're telling you. That's not the model. 
Well, Julie, because you mentioned Australia, we did get this tweet from Steve, and he wants to know why the educational needs of the Aboriginal community in Australia continue, as he says, to be lacking in materials, teachers, et cetera. And I know during your term you had the Close the Gap program, so can you explain what that was and, and if you agree with his tweet? Yeah. Uh, the Close the Gap program was to look at the big gaps between uh, Indigenous Australians and the rest of Australia on things like life expectancy, health outcomes, education, employment, and say by 2020 we are going to be narrowing those gaps. And some of them are very difficult, been there a long period of time, but progress has been made in education and the new funding model that I worked on when I was Prime Minister and before that as Education Minister funds schools based on need and that means more resources flow to schools teaching Indigenous Australians the 2014 than before. 2014 now, 2020 is not too far away. Do you think you'll meet those goals? Oh, I think uh, we'll meet the education goals. We were tracking progress and actually in our last round of national testing some very pleasing progress was made uh, for Indigenous students which is great. So Julia, I can see why GP went looking for you <laughs> because you are across global issues you've traveled the world you have a passion for education there's a little bit of me that's going but do you not miss being a politician <laughs> it's like you must miss it a bit <laughs> i mean i would love to be called prime minister <laughs> i mean that is kind of sassy yeah, it's kind of sassy uh look i i i do uh miss it in part and right. so just explain that it's the it's the kind of curious thing when yeah. in many ways the best thing that you'll ever do mm -hmm. and the hardest thing you'll ever do yeah. has come to an end and so you miss it because yeah. it's the best thing you'll ever do yeah. uh, but there's some relief there too because yeah. it's the end of the hardest thing you'll ever do so uh, there are some things about it i miss dreadfully yeah. uh, some things i don't miss at all uh, but i'm relishing this opportunity to take that passion for education sure. into a new domain. Can I tell you what I miss? I miss your feisty question time. Really? Okay. <laughs> this little comment um, and this little bit I'm going to play off YouTube was described as the smackdown of the century. I really enjoyed your company. I love hearing you chat to our education advocates, but this is the Julia Gillard that I love. <laughs> Have a look at this. Position. And in so doing, I say to the Leader of the Opposition, I will not be lectured about sexism and misogyny by this man. I will not. And the Government Order. will not be lectured about sexism Order. and misogyny by this man. Not now, not ever. The Leader of the Opposition says that people who hold sexist views and who are misogynists are not appropriate for high office. Well, I hope the Leader of the Opposition has got a piece of paper and he is writing out his resignation. Because if he wants to know what misogyny looks like in modern Australia, he doesn't need a motion in the House of Representatives. He needs a mirror. That's what he needs. Let's go through so the So how many billions leaders. of dollars do you need for the GPE? Well, we're kicking off replenishment next week and yeah. we're trying to raise $3.5 billion dollars from donor governments. I would just play them this. <laughs> <laughs> and they'd be like, okay, here you go. <laughs> Whatever you want. <laughs> uh, well, because of the way that went around the world, yes. uh, many of the uh, leaders and ministers for education and ministers yes. for finance I talked to actually say, oh, I saw your speech. <laughs> and, and some of them say, particularly the women, great yeah. speech. And right. some of them just say, I saw it with a certain nervous air. So Yes, that's good. We so can play know, on they've that. They've got good Julia, <laughs> and then you've got feisty Julia, and and if you need to, you can roll out feisty Julia, right? Uh, yeah, uh, good good <laughs> Julia and feisty Julia are the same Julia. Oh, all right, it's just you I know if you. If, if you get in my way <laughs> on something I really care about, look out, uh -oh. and I'm happy to leave that as a message about education and replenishment. We have so much more to talk about. We're going to wrap up for now, but we yes. have a post show. Malika, yes. what, give us a sense of what I, I will, and, and, and maybe you can answer this in a yes or no question. Someone picked up on the male chauvinism because of that video, but this person follows up with this question. Will you consider vying for elective position in the future? No, in Australian politics, once you're done, you're done. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Good Julia, feisty Julia. The very same person, and we're taking her 
to the post show at stream.alzira.com. You have more questions? Hashtag AJStream. Now, on the next show, from Kenya to Jordan, we're going to find out how some refugees are flipping the script on the harsh realities of camp life. So stand by for the Refugee Camp Reality Show and so much more. Stay with us. The post show is next at stream.alzira.com with Julia Gillard. We will see you online. Thanks for watching. Hello again, this is the Streams Online Post Show. We're talking about global education development with Julia Gillard. We're going to get right back to the conversation, but first of all, let me just check they're still there. Asma, Nikhil, Franklin, Hannah, hello. Yes, we're here. Hello. All right. Hi, we're here. Let's do a little yes. review of what you've heard so far. Aha, Hannah, mm -hmm. what do you think? Yeah. Uh, I think it's amazing that um, Ms. Willard is able, is able to uh, uh, so much on behalf of her experience in education and it's such a great learning experience to to hear about her experiences so far. Franklin? Well uh, it's been wonderful uh, but w what I'm even more interested in finding out is how Julia Gillard is going to use her star power and political uh, mileage to make sure that commitment uh, on the pledges are followed through by mm. the nations and the, and the partners. All right, Julia. That's a great question. And uh, what we certainly do uh, is we monitor that people deliver what they say they're going to deliver. And pledges matter. Pledges both by donor governments and developing country partners to increase education budgets. So I can assure you we collect them all. Uh, that The kickoff will be in Brussels. We'll follow it up and pledges will flow post Brussels too. But they will be monitored and people will be held to account for keeping their word. Malika. Um, we, we asked this question of our community and, mm. and looking for ways to combat uh, the number of, of children who aren't in school and ways to increase those numbers. Right. Um, what measures should be taken? And lots of people sent in their ideas. This one is from Tuba. She says, by encouraging women to take part in policy making and, and politics. So Julia, naturally, um, my question to you though is have people come up to you and said you know you are an inspiration i want to do what you're doing and, and but i i face these obstacles i do get a lot of very generous comments um and from many women because they've seen the misogyny right, uh, speech as it came to be knowing <laughs> the parliamentary contribution uh and it's sort of two-sided uh some come up and say I want to do what you've done, I want to go into politics. Worryingly, some come up and say, you know, I've seen some of the things you encountered in politics and it's put me off. And I always try and say, you know, even though there are times you've really got to battle through in politics and women in politics face sexist analysis and all of that, uh, that, you know, the, the delight of making change and having the ability to do that and pursue what you believe in outweighs all of the negatives of politics. So my advice really is work out, you know, what you're passionate about and if you want to take that into politics, stay true to that purpose because if you go in not quite knowing what you want to do next, mm. there's too many forces that will buffet you around to really get anything big done. Mm. Julie, you know when you said, I will resign, did you actually really mean it? You said, if I, d if I don't achieve this, then I, I will step down and resign from politics. Were you expecting that to actually happen? Well, I said uh, that in the context of instability in my political party and that yeah. we knew that there would be a leadership ballot and I was of the view whoever won should go on to be leader and whoever right. left should exit Australian politics. So wow. I did mean it. And I, kind of severe. And I did do it. Yeah, wow. but it, it was the right judgment call, I believe. All right. And, you know, I've gone on to uh, do this next and right. it's very enjoyable. It's brought me here. Oh, I'm happy about that. <laughs> okay, have a look at my laptop here. This is uh, Julia's book, which is coming out in October, called My Story. That's right. 
usually in, in a memoirs book of somebody who's a, a very well-known politician there's always a little bit in it which makes the headlines just let's just cut to the chase and tell me what you think that is <laughs> <laughs> you know what i'm saying don't you there's always yes. something it's like <laughs> that's the scandal tell me what the scandal bit is oh uh, i'm gonna have to disappoint you what? and let you down get you're, out, you're, 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 get out. <laughs> you're going to uh, have to buy the book no julia seriously just give us like a, a like a little tease uh, a, 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 a tiny for the children of the world Julia. oh uh, for the children of the world now yes. you're making me feel bad but we'll have to come <laughs> back and talk about the book oh on my another goodness. occasion all right i've worked uh, so hard this. When it when it gets out, nothing? it'll uh, be there. Nothing? No, 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 no. <laughs> oh. oh my goodness! All right, uh, uh, Malika. Well, Nikhil is actually uh, the author of an upcoming book. Nikhil, do you have any questions on 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 being an author and making sure it's a bestseller that you might want to ask? <laughs> um, no, I mean I uh, I'm interested in, re in reading her um, her memoir and um, but yeah, I mean my my, my I, I had a question I was regarding. Um, the social costs, what happens when um, you have you add schooling into a community. Because based on my research and some of the anecdotes and stories I've collected, um, there becomes a lot of unhappiness and boredom of children in school. And I think um, my question is, how do you combat that? And how do you ensure that um, as a result of, of schooling, you don't receive a lot of this pressure um, from the testing and the homework, um, and you ensure that young people are much more satisfied um, in, in their learning experiences. Mm. We're actually uh, working through some of this at Brookings and through a process it's involved in. So with another hat on at uh, the Brookings think tank here in Washington, I'm working with a series of others on this thing called learning metrics, which sounds really boring, uh, but it's mm. a way of really trying to capture what makes a quality education? Uh, not only one that makes uh, people literate and numerate, but gives them a breadth of learning opportunities, keeps them engaged. How can we measure that? And when we can measure it, know how to improve it. So I agree with you, when quality is lacking, kids are bored, restless, then that's gonna show up in non-attendance, or playing up in class or dropping out entirely. We've got to be on a journey to lift quality. And coming back to the discussion about the post 2015 mm -hmm. agenda, the mm -hmm. UN uh, goals, uh, one of the things I think personally we should be heading towards is we said through the Millennium Development Goals, let's get kids into school, universal access to primary school. We've got more work to do to achieve that. But I think the next set of goals needs to be access, but plus improving the quality of what's happening in schools so kids are more engaged in learning and happier to stay there. Let me just check in with Asma. Asma, you've been listening to Julia now for ooh, 40 minutes in this conversation. What do you make of it? What's your review so far? Yeah, I just wanted to say about um, the quality, the system in Afghanistan. So it's really different than in other um, education systems. Like what we do in Afghanistan is actually we read the book we listen to what our how our teacher explains it and then we memorize it and for the day of exam it's just we give question i mean when our teachers tell ask us question we just give answers of our memorization and that's all we just study for our exam and we memorize all the book what do you think we should um, do about that i mean to change the quality of getting an education here well, you must have an incredible memory, so that's a good thing <laughs> to have an incredible memory. Uh, but uh, your schooling, uh, I would wish for you that it's about more than memorising things and that it ends up being about problem solving and creative thinking. So it's not just what someone else has said and you've got to remember it, but it's what you think and you can debate with other students in your class and work through what's right or what's wrong, or you can use your imagination and perhaps you know write poetry or essays that capture that imagination. Um, that's, you know, in technical terms, that's about improving the curriculum and the process of teaching. It's about lifting teacher quality. You know, Afghanistan's been so war-torn that to create schooling and get kids into school is kind of an amazing thing that it's happening and happening in large numbers. But then there's the next stage, and that's what you're telling us we need to do, which is lift the quality of it so you get to do more things than you're doing now. And I'm going to remember that comment 
comment and when we're talking with the Education Minister from Afghanistan, pass it on as something to think about as we try to work to improve education uh, with your country and in your country. Asma? Yeah. Yes? Are your teachers watching this show? Sorry? Are your teachers watching the stream today? Are your teachers? teachers? Yes. I I don't think so. Because I hope they're not. Because <laughs> I think you just actually questioned how good they might be, right, Asma? Yes. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> I think you might be in some trouble. You've got some time between now and school tomorrow to think up a really good excuse <laughs> as to why you complained about the way they were teaching you. <laughs> I think that's showing yes. a capacity for critical thinking whether or not it's being taught. So that's good. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll show them this tape, Asma, before you get in trouble. All right, so we're going to wrap up the conversation right now. Julia Gillard, it's been a pleasure having you. It's been wonderful to be here. And we've also had Asma, Nikhil, Frank, and Hannah, thank you very much for being part of our conversation. Really appreciated your time. And uh, Malika, online conversation. Um, lots of people are loving it. There's yeah. a couple of people geeking out <laughs> that you're on the show today. Wow. <laughs> we love those people. Right. Um, this last one I'll wrap up, but this is a tweet from Shireen, and she wants to know the most prominent, promising initiative that you've teamed up for, and that maybe we can look forward to coming yeah. up next. Uh, look, because of the you know different countries, different ways, there's not one thing. But looking around the world, so many countries making big progress. Afghanistan, you know, Yemen, really hard uh, places to work. What that should say to us is it can be done and if we can do it, we should do it. And if you don't do it, we're going to get feisty Julia on <laughs> you. <laughs> Julia Gillard, thank you so much. Thank you. Moving on, the next programme. We're going to look at what life is like in a refugee camp. We're going to be looking from Kenya to Jordan to find out how some refugees are sharing their stories. It is going to be a really fascinating show. We'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.